Good evening. This is Crime Classics. I am Thomas Highland with another true story of crime. Listen. And that was Giovanni d'Este running stealthily in the year 1500. And that was Guido della Miopa, friend of Giovanni and with him hired assassin. And that was Michelotto, who was chap that hired them for a piece of work this night on the streets of Rome in front of St. Peter's Cathedral. And here is Michelotto's boss. And having converged on a prearranged spot, it is he. Kill him. Tonight, my report to you on Cesare Borgia, his most difficult murder. Crime Classics. A series of true crime stories taken from the records and newspapers of every land from every time. Your host each week, Mr. Thomas Highland, connoisseur of crime, student of violence, and teller of murders. Now, once again, Mr. Thomas Highland. They dressed well in those days, and no wonder. They had the Duc de Valentinois to design their clothes for them. And all of us know, of course, that he was the chap who invented the Italian dart and tuck, as well as the one-finger thimble. Uh, so, a night out then in Rome, a formal garden dinner at the Borgias. Over there by the wine service, just delivered by Michelangelo, is Paolo Orsino, young noble. He's dressed in red satin and cloth of gold. The hem of his surplice is studded with rubies, and his hat is trimmed with stiff gold lace. And there is Michelotto, a close friend to Cesare. And to Cesare's sister, Lucrezia. Lucrezia, Lucrezia, such a wonderful party. Oh, how stunning you are. Valentine, why didn't he? And the ring, it's new, isn't it? Michelangelo. See, it opens, and a cunning little needle here. <laughs> Lucrezia, Lucrezia. Michelotto, I should tell you, is garbed in a livery of crimson velvet and yellow silk. His shirt is adorned with a double row of rubies. As big as beans. Michelotto! Michelotto! And here's our host, chastely dressed, simply, a great necklace of pearls about his throat, the only adornment. Michelotto, dear friend. Yes, that I... You've outdone yourself this evening. I was just saying to Lucrezia... Whatever you say to her, Michelotto, whatever you say to my sister, let there be adjectives of beauty and spinning light. Let there be words that mean flight. And song and loveliness. <laughs> <laughs> Embrace me, brother. Put your warmth to my cheek and I'll whisper to you. Yeah. Dear brother, magnificent brother. Pretty, pretty. My husband beckons me. Alfonso waves come to me. Then go to him. Go, go. Fly to him. Micheletto. Yes. Lucrezia loves her husband, Micheletto. Yes. See how she greets him. Ardently. Micheletto. Say it. He does the world no good. <laughs> I was searching for the very sentiment. You have found it. Yes, he does the world no good. He, Alfonso, being nephew to the King of Naples, I thought he would be useful. That in this bringing together of all Italy, his marriage to my sister would help wed the warring provinces. And Alfonso has done nothing. He has done nothing. Except make love to your sister. Mm, except that. Uh, see there? She has not released him from his greetings yet. No, I cannot look upon it. Listen, what? This worthless man, this Alfonso of Aragon. What of him? Aragon blood is red. Deep, deep red and spills nobly. Dear friend. Dear, dear friend. <laughs> past the table set with succulents from all over the world, and jewel-studded goblets and golden dishes, past the gilded youngsters, servants, past the Moorish maidens spinning to bell and tambourine, and here a giant, mute and muscular, who supplies poses, and dancing about him, dwarves from Madagascar, dervishes from India, past all of them and into another part of the garden and down the path and here, the place of deep-throated tiger lily and Grecian fragments 
strewn in study disarray. This place. He thinks he plans to kill me, wife. Since returning from Firenze, your thoughts are dismal with death and sorrow. You saw how he looked upon me with loathing. What brother loathes the world except that which is in his arms at the moment? Tell me this, Lucrezia. What? What does he say of me? He asks if I love you. And you answer? I say yes. Then he asks if I am pleased with you. And you answer? I say yes. And I offer my lips to the sun as if I am kissing you, and I say yes. Divine. Divine, Lucrezia. You so beauty, my husband. You so bravery and daring. Listen. Yes? Do something brave now, do a daring thing. Leave. Leave? The palace of Cesare, the feasting that gets begun? I want to. But Cesare is disfavored. Daring, brave. Yes. Your handmaiden said you spend the morning by the fountains, and that you spend it sadly. Why? Not sadness, quite, but... Lucrezia. Yes? Last night I had a spectacle prepared for you, a spectacle of fireworks, and Arabian steed, and a troop of Arabian maids, and a magician from Samarkand, and... And I was not there. And you were not there, nor your husband. The moment of my present sadness started then, and I left. Tell me of it. My husband thinks you look upon him with loathing. Oh? He said to me he thinks you wish him dead. Oh. Now, tell me true. You are my sister. Tell me true, Chazen. You are my sister and you love a man, therefore I cannot think evil of him. Even though he could make an alliance for you with Naples through his uncle and does not, and so Naples is still a thorn that scratches cruelly your hand. I do not think in such a way, sister. Liar. Liar, then. So believe what you wish. Believe that your husband will live or that he will perish. Believe what you wish. Dear Chazen. Yes? Do something, dear Cesare, to prove to my husband your esteem for him. First, Cesare is sent to Alfonso a gift, a marble basin filigreed with gold, and in it, an invitation to meet him at Michelangelo's studio, where the artist was sculpting a portrait of one of Cesare's favorites. See how a master chisel stone into beauty, good Alfonso. To marvel. To marvel? (laughs) The artistry or the lady? I did not notice the lady, for your sister fills my eyes ever. At all times. Pretty. Pretty. Hmm. Come. And see here, this salt cellar Michelangelo makes for the Vatican. And this design for a catapult. I am not stupid, brother-in-law. Why did you bid me here? Surely not to enjoy the artistry of Michelangelo, for all Rome knows of it and praises it. Why did you summon me here? Here among these jewels of the world, I offer you another jewel, Alfonso. My friendship and proof of it. What proof? If you have the courage to accept it, stay on. A bullfight, then. Let us offer ourselves to that sport, to the horns of the bull, each for some turn. And when one is in jeopardy, the other will save him. What say you, Alfonso? I say well said. Then you will do it. I will do it. Wait, then. Please the better. Farewell. And Michelangelo, my farewell to you... Gold for your cold day's pleasure. Farewell. So a bullfight was arranged. Each fought the bull in his turn. And when the bull had 
Cesare in a precarious position. Alfonso ran out, waved a red cloak and distracted the bull, and then bravely slew the beast. And in his turn, Cesare succored Alfonso when Alfonso fought the bull and was in peril. This is the way nobility proved to the world that they were fond of each other, friends to the death, buddies. I'm glad. I'm happy. I'm delighted. Friends. 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 And now, friend of my life, dear Alfonso, a boon. Whatever. This boon. Meet with me in front of St. Peter's this evening so that I can take you to Master Julio for a fitting. Friend of my life, I will be there. Farewell to you. And to you, my sister. Fare you well. How did it go? I asked him to meet with me in front of St. Peter's Cathedral this evening. That I would take him to Master Julio for a fitting. <laughs> what bait that is. The vain man. At nine of the clock. Now that he trusts me, he will be there. Will you meet with me? Yes. And tell Giovanni of the poignard of the meeting. And Guido. Yes. Four of us, then. And we will approach from four directions. Each of us must, so as not to be identified. <laughs> you remember Francesco well, I see. Yes. Then tonight, dear friend. Yes. as the bell of St. Peter's was tolling nine of the clock. From the east, Giovanni d'Este of the poignard. From the west, Guido della Miopa of the dagger. From the north, Michelotto. And from the south... It is he. Kill him. Violets! No! No! <laughs> Listening to Crime Classics and your host, Thomas Highland, and his report to you on Cesare Borgia, his most difficult murder. I'd like to add my two cents to the Renaissance. The Renaissance was an awakening from the Middle Ages, which was a period of darkness and brutality. And now, the Renaissance, and this is my observation, it did indeed bring back the humanities, but it also refined brutality. In other words, inhumanities and tortures were made more exquisite, called progress. So against this background of new light, Ornate fashionings in stone and oars, brilliant artistry, the city of Rome, which in the year 1500 was held in sway by the folk who lived on the hill, the Borgias. They lived on a hill and in a grand castle. And in this grand castle was a large and vaulted room. And in this large and vaulted room, casting startling shadow, Cesare. Cesare Borgia. Your Excellency... Your Excellency Cesare. Up, Paolo, and say what? Dark and terrible deed this night. Oh, darkness, what deed? Upon the stoop of St. Peter's blood ran blasphemy on to murder. Murder? Of your own. Who? Who? Husband to your sister. Who? What cold shudder these words caused my body to hold. Say what has happened. Masked strangers attacked him with poignard and knife, and there they left him. Stuck. And he is dead. No. 
No. Not quite. But you said murder. Which it will be at any moment. The doctors say each breath he draws may be his last. But he is not dead. He will be. Come, if you wish it, and sob upon my shoulder. Come. Wait. Wait now. Come. Sob out your heart, Cesare. So I can say to Rome, your heart welled up in despair. Silent tears are all... Oh, Cesare. Oh, Paolo. Is there something here I interrupt, or am I welcome? Grief always welcomes companionship. Come grieve with me, Michelotto. Alas, but what is the sorrow? Tell him, Paolo. This night of assassins and blood and the dying of Alfonso of Aragon. (sighs) But he is not yet dead. Not yet dead? But he will be. A certainty. Uh. Now we must ponder, then. Who would have cause to want such a noble's death? Masks, they were. His uncle. Yes. His uncle, Francesco Gazella. Yes. Yes. Francesco Gazella, brother to his mother, who once told his friends, you remember, of a dream he had, how he slew Alfonso. I remember. Oh, yes. Then wake Francesco Gazello, Paolo. Then wake the headsman. Let justice be done. Amen. Amen. in good humor, smiling, joking with the headsman, and similar manifestations of no hard feelings. His last statement on records is interesting, too. This is a dream, he said, and I shall awaken in a little while and have my wine and bun. The records state that when Francesco's head was exhibited to the Roman crowd, it wore a nice smile. Well, as you know, Alfonso just refused to draw his last breath. Inhale, exhale, he wouldn't stop. He didn't regain consciousness, but he didn't stop breathing either. So Cesare went to visit him, and in the ante room to the sick chamber... You did it! Lucrezia Borgia making an accusation... It does not matter who you executed, who you gave to the headsman's block. You did it. You caused it to be done. But no, sister, be calm by this assurance. I had nothing to do with the stabbing of your husband. Treachery, villainy, vile deed. I sobbed on Paolo's shoulder when I heard the news. Do not present me with a whimper, Cesare. I am your sister Lucrezia. I know you well. And I know what has happened, this farce of the bullring. To beguile Rome that you favored Alfonso. To make her not point a finger and say you had him slain. If I wanted his death, why have I come to him to lend my tears to his pillow? Tears without war. Bitter tears of sorrow and despair. Chill tears because there is death in them. A small death of me at his dying. I go to him. And I wish you to guard my husband from you. Your Excellency. How is he? Remarkable. A miracle. He should be dead, but he isn't. A miracle. Remarkable. Oh, Alfonso, dear friend, almost brother to me. As you will take your place in heaven now, smile then because you are revenged. Vile man of an uncle slew you. And what reason could he have had, Alfonso? Gentle Alfonso, sweet and brave man to have struck you down. I have been stricken too for you are beloved of fair Lucrezia, as I am beloved by her. Therefore we share a sainted place. And when you will go, I will live loneliness. Had you lived longer, Sweet friend, what night we would have been. What harmful brother takes you from this place. You weep true tears, <laughs> warm tears. Take me from this place. Yes. Physician, 
Yes, physician. A tear of Chesare splashed upon my sleeve. Look. A true tear. A jewel of a tear. You think Chesare wants this one alive? He wept, I saw it. Do you think we should try to save this Alfonso? If it would please Chesare? I think it would. We pass the potion, physician. And the flagon of ointment from Caucasia. And what if the pearls dissolved in that your wine? Good, good. And the crushed scorpion? Good, good. You apply then, physician. And I will recite the phrases I learned in the cartoon. I want you to. I have no idea whether it was the ointment from Caucasia or the crushed scorpion, or the phrases the good physician had picked up at the headwaters of the Nile. But whatever it was, Alfonso one day opened his eyes and hopped right out of bed. A miracle. Remarkable. How do you feel? I am alive again. Alive again. Alive. Many stab wounds, scars. I am alive again. Alive again, alive again. To reward me. I gave you Vecchio wine. And I whispered in your ear strange and marvelous phrases. Reward me. Doctor... Friends, both of you shall be rewarded. I do not know what magic they use, the physician. To the block with them, both of them. Yes, yes, Your Excellency. Wait. Yes. Have them take poison instead. Before I can explain their death, there's a sour stomach. But how can I explain their heads? Wit, exquisitely spoken, Sir Joseph. What assassins do you draw to you, Michelotto, that they strike 50 blows and kill not? Get rid of this one. Go, Paolo. Do my bid. Have the physician... Drink poison. Mm -hmm. Go. I pose the question, Michelotto... What assassin... You joined us, and you struck him as well as we. Yes. I must tell you something. What? The court notices the travail on your face now that Alfonso lives. They laugh behind your back. They... Who knocks? Your sister, Lucrezia, knocks. Give her entrance, Michelotto. What do you want, sister? Your frown is as deep as mine. What do you want? To tell you that I am weary. Weary? A pretense of Alfonso. He is well again. You should exult. He is a dodderer and a fool and weakling. Now a puny babe to be tended. I am weary of it. Oh? I love him no more. Come to me, sister. Weep upon my shoulder for your lost love. Yes. Always to you. Yes. Should I go away, Cesare? There are scholars in Pisa to regale you for a month, sister. Go there. Mm. So that I need not see it done or hear of it too long. Mm, go. Then come back to me, renewed, gentle sister. Brother? Gentle Lucrezia. Gentle Galote. be taken in sleep, Alfonso. No. <coughs> oh, good, Nicolotto. Muscular friend, how your sinews make a dance. Uh -huh, ghostly dance. Oh, see the pose of you, Nicolotto. Classic pose. <laughs> oh, see. 
is dead. Take certain of it. Take my poignard. Yes. <clears throat> it is a night's nice deed, and it is done. Cesare journeyed to Pisa. Here, he and Lucrezia sat at the feet of scholars and drank deep the wine of knowledge. One day, one of these savants tarried too long with Lucrezia on some question not philosophical. That afternoon, the fellow fell down dead from drinking deep the wine of Cesare, one of a series of a lot of fellows who dropped down dead before Cesare himself did, a long time later on a battlefield in Spain. Later still, Lucrezia died in a convent. Ah, those Borgia. Just a moment, Thomas Highland will tell you about next week's crime classic. Cesare Borgia, tonight's crime classic, was adapted from reports and accounts of the Times by Morton Fine and David Friedkin. The music was composed and conducted by Bernard Herman, and the program is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. Thomas Highland is portrayed on radio by Lou Merrill. In tonight's story, Whitfield Connor was heard as Cesare, William Conrad as Michelotto, and Betty Lou Gerson as Lucrezia. Featured in the cast were Lamont Johnson, Edgar Barrier, Hi Averback, and Larry Thor. Bob Lamont speaking. And here again is Thomas Highland. Next week, Rutland, Vermont, in the year 1850. The three fellows named Leathers, Vermontians by way of Egypt, met a young lady and were all taken by her. But you remember the old saw... The two's company, four is a crowd. It's listed in my files as Widow McGee and the Three Gypsies of Vermont Fandango. Thank you. Good night. <laughs> to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.